Elizabeth Short, born on July 29, 1924, in the Hyde Park area of Boston, Massachusetts, was the third of five daughters of Cleo A. Short and Phoebe May Sawyer. The Short family briefly moved to Portland, Maine, in 1927, before eventually settling in Medford, Massachusetts, a suburb of Boston, in the same year. In 1929, Short's father, who used to construct miniature golf courses, lost most of his savings in the stock market crash. In 1930, his abandoned car was found on the Charlestown Bridge, leading to the assumption that he had jumped into the Charles River. Short's mother, believing her husband to be deceased, started working as a bookkeeper to provide for the family. Due to her struggles with bronchitis and severe asthma attacks, Short had lung surgery when she was 15. After the surgery, doctors recommended that she spend time in a milder climate to prevent further respiratory issues. As a result, her mother sent her to stay with family friends in Miami, Florida, during the winters for the next three years. Short eventually dropped out of Medford High School during her sophomore year. In late 1942, Short's mother received a letter of apology from her presumed deceased husband, revealing that he was actually alive and had started a new life in California. At the age of 18, in December, Short moved to Vallejo, California, to live with her father whom she hadn't seen since she was six years old. Her father was working at the nearby Mare Island Naval Shipyard on San Francisco Bay. However, disagreements between Short and her father resulted in her moving out in January 1943. Short found employment at the base exchange at Camp Cook, now Vandenberg Space Force Base, near Lompoc. During this time, she briefly lived with a U.S. Army Air Force sergeant who reportedly mistreated her. She left Lompoc in mid-1943 and relocated to Santa Barbara, where she was arrested on September 23, 1943, for underage drinking at a local bar. Juvenile authorities initially sent her back to Massachusetts, but instead she returned to Florida and only made occasional visits to her family near Boston. While in Florida, Short met Major Matthew Michael Gordon, Jr., a decorated Army Air Force officer training for deployment to the Southeast Asian Theater of World War II. Short shared with friends that Gordon had proposed marriage in a letter while recovering from injuries sustained in a plane crash in India. She accepted his proposal, but tragically, Gordon died in a second crash on August 10, 1945, less than a week before the war's end. In July 1946, Short traveled to Los Angeles to visit Army Air Force Lieutenant Joseph Gordon Fickling, an acquaintance from Florida who was stationed at the Naval Reserve Air Base in Long Beach. She spent the final six months of her life in Southern California, primarily in the Los Angeles area. Before her untimely death, Short worked as a waitress and rented a room behind the Florentine Gardens nightclub on Hollywood Boulevard. While there have been varying descriptions and depictions of her as an aspiring or would-be actress, it is worth noting that she had no known acting roles or credits, despite some sources claiming she had aspirations to become a film star. After a short trip to San Diego with Robert Red Manley, a 25-year-old married salesman whom she was dating, Elizabeth Short returned to her residence in Los Angeles on January 9, 1947. According to Manley, he dropped Short off at the Biltmore Hotel located in downtown Los Angeles. Short had plans to meet her visiting sister from Boston that afternoon. Some accounts suggest that Biltmore Hotel staff members remembered seeing Short using the lobby telephone. Shortly after, she was reportedly spotted by individuals at the Crown Grill Cocktail Lounge situated at 754 South Olive Street, approximately three-eighths mile away from the Biltmore. On the morning of January 15, 1947, the lifeless body of Elizabeth Short, completely naked and severed into two parts, was discovered in an empty lot on the west side of South Norton Avenue, between Coliseum Street and West 39th Street, in the underdeveloped neighborhood of Limert Park. Betty Berzinger, a local resident, made the grisly find around 10 a.m. while walking with her three-year-old daughter. Initially mistaking it for a discarded store mannequin, she soon realized it was a corpse and promptly sought help by rushing to a nearby house to contact the police. Short's body had been brutally mutilated, with the severance occurring at the waist and blood drained from her body, leaving her skin pale white. 
medical examiners estimated that she had been dead for approximately 10 hours prior to the discovery, placing her time of death either during the evening of January 14th or the early hours of January 15th. The killer had seemingly washed the body, and Short's face bore a horrific Glasgow smile, caused by deep cuts extending from the corners of her mouth to her ears. She had multiple cuts on her thighs and breasts, with portions of flesh completely sliced off. The lower half of her body was found a foot away from the upper portion, and her intestines had been neatly tucked beneath her buttocks. The body was deliberately posed, with her hands positioned above her head, elbows bent at right angles, and legs spread apart. Upon the discovery, a gathering of onlookers and reporters quickly formed at the scene. Aggie Underwood, a reporter from the Los Angeles Herald Express, was among the first to arrive and took several photographs of the crime scene and the deceased. Detectives discovered a heel print and tire tracks near the body, as well as a cement sack containing watery blood in close proximity. On January 16, 1947, an autopsy was conducted by Frederick Newbar, the Los Angeles County Coroner, on Elizabeth Short's body. According to Newbar's autopsy report, Short was 5 feet 5 inches tall, weighed 115 pounds, and had light blue eyes, brown hair, and severely decayed teeth. Ligature marks were observed on her ankles, wrists, and neck, and there was an irregular laceration with superficial tissue loss on her right breast. Superficial lacerations were also found on her right forearm, left upper arm, and lower left chest. The body had been bisected using a technique known as hemicorporectomy, taught in the 1930s, resulting in the complete removal of the lower half of her body by transecting the lumbar spine between the second and third lumbar vertebrae, which also severed the intestine at the duodenum. Newbar's report indicated minimal bruising along the incision line, suggesting that it had been performed post-mortem. Another gaping laceration measuring four plus a quarter inches in length ran vertically from the umbilicus to the suprapubic region. Lacerations on each side of her face, extending from the corners of her lips, measured three inches on the right side and two plus a half inches on the left. Although the skull was not fractured, bruising was observed on the front and right side of her scalp, along with a small amount of bleeding in the subarachnoid space on the right side, indicative of blows to the head. The cause of death was determined to be hemorrhaging from the facial lacerations and shock resulting from blows to the head and face. Newbar also noted that Short's anal canal was dilated at one inch, suggesting a possible sexual assault. Samples were taken from her body for sperm testing, but the results came back negative. Short was identified through her fingerprints, which were sent to the Federal Bureau of Investigation using a device called Sound Photo that transmitted images via telephone. Her fingerprints were already on file from her arrest in 1943. Once Short's identity was confirmed, reporters from the Los Angeles Examiner, owned by William Randolph Hearst, contacted her mother, Phoebe Short, in Boston. The reporters initially deceived Phoebe, informing her that her daughter had won a beauty contest before revealing the tragic truth of her murder. The examiner also offered to cover Phoebe's travel expenses and accommodations if she would come to Los Angeles to assist with the police investigation, but this offer was mainly a ploy to control access to her and protect the newspaper's exclusive coverage. The Examiner and another Hearst newspaper, The Herald Express, sensationalized the case, with one Examiner article describing the black-tailored suit short had last been seen wearing as a tight skirt and a sheer blouse. The media dubbed her the Black Dahlia and portrayed her as an adventuress who frequented Hollywood Boulevard. Additional newspaper reports, such as one published in the Los Angeles Times on January 17, sensationalized the murder as a sex fiend slaying. On January 21, 1947, someone claiming to be Elizabeth Short's killer made a phone call to James Richardson, the editor of The Examiner. The caller congratulated Richardson on the newspaper's coverage of the case and mentioned plans to eventually surrender to the police, but not before giving them a further chase. The caller also informed Richardson to expect some of Short's belongings to be sent in the mail as souvenirs. On January 24, a suspicious manila envelope was discovered by a postal worker. The envelope was addressed to the Los Angeles Examiner and other Los Angeles papers and had words cut and pasted from newspapers. 
A message on the envelope stated, here is Dahlia's belongings, letter to follow. Inside the envelope, Short's birth certificate, business cards, photographs, names on pieces of paper, and an address book with the name Mark Hansen were found. The contents had been meticulously cleaned with gasoline, similar to Short's body, leading the police to suspect the sender was the killer. Although some partial fingerprints were obtained from the envelope, they were compromised during transit and couldn't be properly analyzed. On the same day, a handbag and a black suede shoe were discovered on top of a garbage can in an alley near Norton Avenue, not far from the crime scene. The items had also been wiped clean with gasoline, destroying any potential fingerprints. On March 14, what appeared to be a suicide note was found in a shoe along the ocean's edge in Venice. The note, written in pencil, stated that the author had been waiting for the police to capture them for the Black Dahlia killing but decided to take their own life instead. The pile of men's clothing containing the note was reported by a beach caretaker and subsequently brought to the attention of the police. The clothing, which included a coat, trousers, t-shirt, jockey shorts, socks, and leisure shoes, provided no clues about the owner's identity. Mark Hansen, the owner of the address book found in the envelope, became a suspect in the case, as he was a wealthy local nightclub and theater owner and had connections with Short. However, he was later cleared of suspicion. The LAPD interviewed numerous men, including Hansen and Robert Red Manley, who had seen Short before her death, but they were also cleared of suspicion. Police investigated various leads and interviewed individuals listed in Hansen's address book, such as Martin Lewis, who had an alibi as he was in Portland, Oregon, at the time of the murder. During the initial stages of the investigation, a large number of investigators from the LAPD, sheriff's deputies, and California State Patrol officers were involved. They conducted searches in different locations, including storm drains, abandoned structures, and the Los Angeles River, but no significant evidence was found. A city councilman offered a substantial reward for information leading to Short's killer, resulting in several false confessions, most of which were dismissed by the police, and some false confessors faced charges of obstruction of justice. On January 26, the examiner received another letter, this time handwritten, which stated, here it is. Turning in Wednesday, January 29, 10 am. Had my fun at police. Black Dahlia Avenger. The letter included a location where the supposed killer claimed they would surrender. Police waited at the designated location on January 29th, but the alleged killer did not appear. Instead, at 1 p.m., the examiner received another cut and pasted letter that said, have changed my mind. You would not give me a square deal. Dahlia killing was justified. The gruesome nature of the crime and the subsequent letters created a media frenzy around Short's murder. Local and national publications extensively covered the story, often reprinting sensationalized reports that falsely claimed Short had been tortured for hours before her death. The police allowed these reports to circulate to hide the true cause of death, cerebral hemorrhage, from the public. Additional details about Short's personal life were made public, including allegations of her rejecting advances from Hansen and a stripper claiming she would lead men on but leave them unsatisfied. This led reporters and detectives to explore the possibility of Short being a lesbian, questioning individuals at gay bars, although this claim was never substantiated. The Herald Express also received several letters from the purported killer, made with cut and pasted clippings, one of which stated, I will give up on Dahlia killing if I get 10 years. Don't try to find me. By February 1st, the Los Angeles Daily News reported that the case had hit a dead end with no new leads for investigators. The Examiner continued to publish stories about the murder and the investigation, making it front-page news for 35 days after the body was discovered. Captain Jack Donahue, the lead investigator, expressed his belief that Short's murder had occurred in a remote building or shack outside of Los Angeles and her body was then transported and disposed of in the city. Due to the precise cuts and dissection of the body, the LAPD considered the possibility that the killer had medical knowledge, leading them to serve a warrant to the University of Southern California Medical School in mid-February 1947. 
they requested a list of the school's students, but the university agreed to cooperate only if the students' identities remained confidential. Background checks were conducted, but no significant leads were found. By the spring of 1947, the investigation into Short's murder had gone cold, and few new leads emerged. Sergeant Finus Brown, one of the main detectives assigned to the case, blamed the press for hindering the investigation by delving into details and reporting unverified information. In September 1949, a grand jury was convened to address the LAPD's shortcomings in solving various unsolved murders, including those of women and children, such as Short's case. In the aftermath of the grand jury, further inquiries were made into Short's background. Detectives traced her movements between Massachusetts, California, and Florida, and interviewed individuals who knew her in Texas and New Orleans. However, these interviews did not yield any valuable information regarding the murder. Short's unsolved murder and the details surrounding it have had a lasting cultural intrigue, generating various theories and public speculation. Her life and death have been the basis of numerous books and films, and her murder is frequently cited as one of the most famous unsolved murders in U.S. history, as well as one of the oldest unsolved cases in Los Angeles County. It has likewise been credited by historians as one of the first major crimes in post-war America to capture national attention. If you found this video intriguing, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more captivating content.